Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting actually a little slight delay. I, I, I assume that means you're, uh, you're probably west of me. Yes, uh, most definitely west of you. Um, that's that's interesting that you say that. Uh, just just given where I am and what I've come to to explore, something about uh, technological and uh, communication difficulties makes sense. What uh, what are the uh, specifics of, of where you're at? Well, I am currently in Northern California, um, kind of near Eureka. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, I've uh, been spending some time on a uh, farm with the family who is actually, there's now four generations of this family, either, you know, that all live here or live nearby and uh, drive in to, to work the farm. So it's, they're really fun. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to, getting to know all of them. Uh, but, but they have been, you know, they, they seem to handle it gracefully, but they, they have been dealing with uh, some strange and troubling things. The eldest just moved in to the, moved on to the property and into the main house. And from what they tell me, there had been unusual occurrences for quite some time before before he came but there was something interesting that happened when he when he arrives he has some memorabilia some military objects that he's kept from the war he has this beautiful collection of these old military safety posters and um you know they're they're remarkable because you know they have that that kind of very like signature from that time uh here in the u.s that kind of very exclamation point enthusiasm you know uh and they, they tend to be uh humorous and just you just you know it's like you just everyone's got that the 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 bright white smile and you just <laughs> it's that kind of attitude but they're they're amazing because they're they're safety posters but they are all about gremlins they they're warning about gremlins uh you know let's see i have a couple images here they're they're amazing it's like you know let's see gremlins are floor greasers like it's this it's this wild combination between um legitimate safety uh concerns and suggestions and you know but just done in this very in this very kind of splashy almost slapsticky way and then there's always the uh you know buy war bonds or back up our battles guys you know <laughs> it's a you know it's like gremlins love to pitch things at your eyes wear safety goggles you know is there a um, is there a visual depiction of what a gremlin looks like on these old posters? Well, you know, this is one of the remarkable things about gremlins is that, you know, in some ways they're they're this perfectly customizable creature because all of the visual representations tend to be very different from one another. Um, you know, I'm thinking of three pronounced visual assignments that have been uh, on the posters here they're kind you know i'd say they're, they're a little bit like uh, creatures that they, they're not in color uh the the humans are in color and the gremlins are in black and white and the gremlins look like oh something that you might see on the jetsons you know that kind of a that kind of a shape you know they're humanoid but then their head's a little bit mm, there's a little bit of, 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 a, of a dome They've got a little, uh, they've got a little Dr. Seuss-like kind of cowlick coming out the top. Um, but they, that's what I would, call, I would say that's the Jetsons, uh, with, that's the Jetsons format. Then there is also, uh, you know, I found a, in the old, I found an old storybook, actually a, a Disney scheme. Disney, Disney was working on a feature about Gremlins 
uh, but it, it didn't it didn't come to fruition. So the only thing that's remaining from that project is um, the illustrations in a book by Roald Dahl. Um, and in at that time, in that way, uh, you know, the gremlins resembled, oh gosh, like the, I mean, I want to call them like little Elmer Fuds because they have that, that squat sort of roundness, you know, um, they're very, you know, all of their, they're very, they're very round and they look, you know, like the little alien creature in Bugs Bunny, you know, like that they, they're, they're much uh, more diminutive and kind of um, playful looking. And then of course, you know, from the eighties, I think we all uh, <laughs> uh, now, you know, think of gremlins as being, you know, this kind of uh, pointy reptilian um, creature with big eyes and sharp long teeth there's so many visual representations of this creature they're always different part of the part of the lore is that these creatures are um, they're, they're they're supposed to be invisible but yet there's a lot of visual representation of it. I, it's not that they're supposed to be invisible it's like that's one of the that's one of the things that was sort of an early sort of an early uh, attributes. They're invisible, you can't see them, but they cause all this mischief. But of course, that's kind of no fun because you have to be able to see the little monster. Anyhow, so he's got, you know, these posters. Um, you know, the gremlins will get you if you don't watch out. Uh, and I think they were hesitant to assign a kind of an aha moment to, to this occurrence, but... There's no question that thinking about these creatures and and the kinds of things that they've been experiencing on the property, it just seemed to kind of make a weird sort of sense and add a context to to everything. The neighbor's dog erupted in the yard, barking at the back fence. It usually did in early darkness. At something in the alley, people still walked. Cats or possums crossed the ruts, inched round the dented cans. But that wasn't the problem, not yet. He put his kettle on and heard the building drum of the coils beneath. It was always violent. He placed a knit square down for his cup. Across the lawn, he could see his daughter and her husband moving around in the soft light of the kitchen. The crowns of their heads crossed the window above the bunching half-curtain by the sink. Farther back, circled with hanging plates, was the sunflower yellow of the wall. He had been here in their guest house for a couple of years. It was peaceful. He did what he could with the yard and the fence and walked on nearby marsh trails in the mornings along the planks and sedges and had learned the birds that circled and landed in the mud and on the wide brown blades of the tall grass. In the nights, he pulled a lamp over to his shoulders, feeling the soft heat, and worked on model planes. In the nights came memories he wasn't sure he wanted, and he liked to glue and paint and hold steady until he couldn't anymore, until his eyes ached deep. He thought it helped, but he wasn't so sure. The planes, though he loved them, made him remember. They stirred things up. He was just running out the safety he had built in his mind. So are you going to tell me? His wife had asked him. Or am I not strong enough for us both? Toward the end of their lives together, which was really the end of life, he was terrified and staring out all the time at the moon. Well, not the moon exactly, but the land underneath. He was remembering the war, rattling hulls over the sea, the weird laughter from the winglets and slats. I'm sorry. He had told her. I'm... I'm scared. He'd scan out over the fields, the tree and pumpkin farm up the road. 
I thought you weren't supposed to see them. She touched his back carefully. They're supposed to be invisible. But I did, he said. We all did. If they're... She stopped herself, then went on. If they're out there, what do they want? I don't know. To finish what they started. In his dreams, he heard them scraping, tasting things, snapping wires like little fish bones on a board. They'll freeze up your camera shutters. They'll bite through your aileron wires. They'll bend and they'll break and they'll batter. They'll jab toasting forks in your eyes. So, basically, <laughs> I've, come, I've come to this in a kind of roundabout way. They're thinking that the, the kinds of things they've been experiencing are basically due to gremlins at this point. I mean, uh, you know, taking that with a grain of salt, they definitely do. But but they, they don't really know what to do about these events. They, they started small. And now they've been escalating actually to quite a frightening degree. And the thing about these these uh, these creatures, they're, they're, they're known as mischief makers. But honestly, the mischief that they make, I mean, it, it's, it's quite deadly. I mean, you know, they're kind of treated as these sort of humorous creatures, but they're, you know, uh, predominantly known for messing with messing with uh, mechanical things um, like sabotaging planes, cutting wires, and causing plane crashes. There's this kind of uncomfortable gap between you know, all these stories that I was reading about about uh, aviation in World War II and you know, gremlins emerged uh, during that time, even though they, they've existed before in different ways. Um, they emerged at that time as kind of this way of coping with just the chaos and the undetermined and unexpected and fearsome events uh, constantly swirling around uh, soldiers. Um, You know, the emerged as this kind of scapegoat as kind of a way to, you know, pass the buck, you know, oh, the gremlins are messing with what, what's wrong with it? Oh, those gremlins, you know, but there's also all of this talk about, you know the 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 plane crashes and the and the and the gun misfires and you know all of the things that they cause, but that you you'll rarely find, if ever, you know the sentence. Uh, you know the the gremlins cut the wires on the plane. It crashed. They all died. Like there's there's this kind of disconnect between the mischief and the heinous pain and death that their actions actually cause, because they're not supposed to have harm necessarily as a goal uh they're just mischievous creatures right but the but all these things they do are very destructive I, again what are the, what are <laughs> what do we what do we think about these about these creatures because they're on the on the farm um they just started to see you know small things a couple of years ago like oh they have a um, part of the farm is a, a nursery where they grow uh, native plants and ground cover and things like that. And um, when I initially spoke with this family, they'd sent me a few pictures from that area. And, you know, they were certainly provocative, but, you know, they tended to be like a picture of, you know, some plants or, you know, in a greenhouse or out on the ground, on the ground. And there was kind of, they, 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 would circle these areas where you could kind of make something out, but it wasn't anything with a discernible shape. You really had to squint and look and maybe, you know, by the, by the act of making these circles, you're definitely more suggestible to something, something being there, but they started to see, they started to see things moving around the farm 
uh, and you know, security cameras installed caught caught nothing. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the family members had their brake lines cut. You know, so there's always this. You always get around to the sinister aspects. Um, uh, it's just such a, it's hard to get a hold on any of this, which seems appropriate for this creature's uh, nature. Of any of the locations that I have visited for quite a long while, I mean, I, I feel like, I feel very much like I and this this family are, are trying to together kind of put pieces together and figure out what's going on. And it, it's it's get it's getting worse. It's, it's getting more and more frightening. And so far, no one has come to harm. But they, at this rate, they certainly will. Um, you know, I hear things at at night, and I, I I just I don't I don't know I don't know what's going on. But I am going to over the next few days go out and talk to some of. Um, some of the, I'm going to try to talk to some of the people in the neighboring properties to see if they've experienced anything similar. Just try to do some fishing uh, because, of course, you can't come right out and say, "Are there? Have you noticed any gremlins on your <laughs> on your property?" Uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but I don't want to spend too long here because I've, I found that after a certain while, I, I do just kind of start. Sp- spinning my wheels. Yeah, you know, um, one of the first cases I ever investigated had something to do with this phenomenon, or, or, or so I think. It was, it was a long, long time ago. I, I think it was some guy in Phoenix. I you know, went over to, to talk to him, interviewed him at length, and um, he had been waking up uh, in the mornings and finding little tiny, teeny uh, dots of mud, basically, all around his, his neck um, and his, his uh, shoulders. And uh, he took photographs of these, and uh, really, these little dots all over were no bigger than uh, like, like a pumpkin seed, and they were easily brushed away. But it was as, as if something had sort of uh, alighted on him in the night, um, it happened, uh, three nights in a row and he got progressively more frightened as to what was going on. Um, there were little splotches, teeny, you know, seed sized splotches of, of mud, um, uh, on his ankles. Um, and it seemed to be getting worse until he, after the third night, he said, okay, well, I'm, I'm setting up the video camera now. And he did so, and he videotaped himself, and there were no further uh, mud spots anywhere on his body. Um, he videotaped him, videotaped himself for about three or four straight nights, and they just gave up. Uh, and they never returned, and what, there wasn't a whole lot I could do with this. Um, so much of it was his, uh, you know, him showing me these photographs and me taking his word for it, and I thought, okay, well. There's only so much to that story. And uh, I think it was uh, more than two months after I talked to him. I got out of the shower one day and I happened to look in the mirror. And up my neck I saw 14, maybe 16 little tiny splotches of uh, dirt, which was was mud. I, I wiped it away like it was nothing. And I, you know, I was younger then. I was more affected by all these things than I would be now. I remember I had a little bit of a, a panicky moment. I wiped the mud away, took a deep breath, um, a little bit uneasy going to sleep that night. But um, the footprints is what I like to refer to them. They, they never came back. They never came back. Mischief. Countable. A playfully annoying action. 
archaic, uncountable, harm or trouble caused by an agent or brought about by a particular cause. Collective, a group or a pack of rats. Note, can also be used to denote mice or magpies. Note, a grouping of magpies can also be a charm, a gulp, or a tiding. It is said that the number of magpies one sees tells if one will have good or bad luck. Traditional nursery rhyme about magpies. One for sorrow, two for mirth, three for a funeral, four for birth, five for heaven, six for hell, seven for the devil, his own self. Corvidae, crows, and cytosiforms, parrots, have, relatively, the largest avian cerebral hemispheres. Song about gremlins from the Royal Air Force in World War II. When you're frozen blue on your spitfire, and you're scared of mosquito pink, when you're thousands of miles from nowhere, and there's nothing below but the drink, it's no good trying to dodge them. The lessons you learnt on the link won't help you evade a gremlin, though you boost and you dive and you jink. Jink. A sudden quick change of direction, as when dodging a pursuer. See also high jinks. Though the heyday of the creature known as the gremlin is, to our books, the mid-twentieth century, the actual root of the term and the story stays hazy, unclear, and disputed amongst historians and storytellers and soldiers going back untold years. Isn't everything. I hope you understand. It's less complicated to think of mechanical failure as brought by pointed external forces. No human error or chaos to fear. That would be humiliating. That would be real. And I want to tell you, because you are my joy. But at the end, when the smoke screams, I know nothing will change. You'll hear it, but won't remember. And I'll go reeling off ground, trying again to put something special to the room. Tiny monsters crashing the jets. Look. I know I'm spinning my veins, but I'll do it anyway. I'll tell you about my day and how I failed at certain things and did okay at others. I'll tell you about the kid and the story I heard that stopped me in my tracks. How he came home, saw the scratches on the screen and the torn couches, and how all the milk in the refrigerator made a white pool through the tamped flowered rug by the phone. How he took his bike to the police station, which he knew from TV, and told the first person he saw inside that he had come for help. He told them, My grandparents are melting. So this was many years ago. I, you know, I, I've alluded to you about how I, um, I used to work for an organization that... Um, had me uh, investigating all sorts of things and kept me moving very quickly uh, all around Europe and Asia, sometimes uh, just to keep me safe. Some of what I was doing was kind of untoward. But uh, I recall one time they, uh, I was actually put up for about eight days in Cairo, and uh, it was actually a very, very nice completely new um, apartment uh, building. I thought, okay, well, this is, this is uh, much improved over what I'm used to. Uh, so remember, I, I, my, my purpose there was to, to meet with a man, and I met with him on the fourth day, I remember. Um, but immediately upon checking in, I became aware of uh, some chat around the building, and then I, I witnessed firsthand that giant stones, the very uh, well-cut, professionally cut, huge stones 
were falling from the edifice of the apartment building onto the sidewalk below. I, I first heard one of these, and then I actually saw one descending uh, on the second day. And um, the, the management didn't know what was going on. <laughs> they apologized. Literally, leave, these stones were leaving gaps in the side of the building. Uh, one at a time they would fall, only just one, and maybe every 18 hours. And this was incredibly dangerous. These things were huge, and they would crash to the sidewalk below. No one seemed to know, have any explanation for this. I remember the, the man I had gone to meet came up, and this was not a man you would describe as having any sort of a uh, sense of humor or personality. In fact, he was he was probably maybe the most terrifying person I've ever dealt with in my life. Uh, but I, I talked to him at great length there. And as we were talking there in the apartment, we heard another stone crash to the sidewalk below. And we both went up to the window to look down. And I, I his his English was not very good. I tried to explain to him what was going on. And he turned to me. And he, he started making these gestures with his hands, these sort of claw-like uh, hopping gestures. And what he was trying to express to me without knowing the word uh, was the concept of gremlins. And when I said that word, he immediately nodded and he smiled. I'd never, I didn't think this man was capable of smile, smiling. And he, we had that weird moment of connection and then we went on our business, and um, I left uh, uh, four or five days later, and uh, it still had not been figured out. Um, I, th- I think they were on the verge of, of closing the building um, and uh, having investigators come. Uh, but I had to leave that mystery uh, behind in, in, in Cairo. That's fascinating. Even, you know, the terms and where the name Gremlin came from is, um, you know, there's, there's just nothing concrete. There, the closest thing I found was there's an old English word, Grimian, which means to vex, right? And um, there's, uh, some people draw parallels to uh, a Grimm's fairy tale. Uh, where there's a thing, Fremlin beer appears in one of the one of the dark tales, but that uh, that is that is in debate as well. You know, there was um, you know Roald Dahl in his children's book. Uh, you know, being the kind of a linguistic gymnast, you know that he that he was. He always liked to play around uh, with things. Um, you know, he came he kind of came up with some some different terms i think there were female gremlins although to me it kind of seems like smurfland where you know they're there but they're not the they're not the emphasis generally um finfinellas were what i think he called uh, the wives of the male gremlins and widgets widgets were the children of gremlins I mean, I have to say that I, I have a hard time embracing embracing them as humorous figures, um, just there to kind of you know make your make your life just a little bit more difficult. I mean, I, because I, I find that the the things that they're doing, I mean, I find very sinister. On the one hand, you have, you have these 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 little round giggling adorable creatures that will go into the pub and 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 have and have drinks with you um who they eat postage stamps uh, <laughs> which is again another very nationalistic nationalistic patriotic uh, detail and then to these these creatures who are are willfully sabotaging mid-flight your planes by drilling holes in the wings I find them quite terrifying. A book written and a book not yet written. She set out for a walk behind the short building, 
finally clocking the hours in the car. The day had been front-loaded with tension, and she took to the road instinctually, barely prepared. But it felt good. And as she unwound and chewed the sharp edges of her bruising brain down, she let herself get too hungry and stopped and ate a diner meal greedily and with great pleasure. It was then she felt the kind of tired that started first behind the eyes in the socket, then spread down to the shoulders and through the ribs like a tugging fan. She wanted to drive just a little more before passing the night, and she needed to move around. So she walked down a trail to the river. She could see stubs of houses next to the alternating hues of their farm. River birds swooping through stashes of trees. Closer to the water, she saw some wide, flat swirls masking the deeper pools. Dusk was falling fast, she realized, and turned back toward the shadow of the rest stop. The grasses tilted over, heaving in the wind. She would first notice something imperceptibly strange about her car and realized that the hood had been raised and set down, not fully shut. She would look around her and see in both sections of the lot the smaller hash marks for cars and the long white lanes for trucks that she was alone. She would find that the car wouldn't start and that both her side mirrors were twisted up and bent nearly upside down, the plastic housings and shards. She heard a scrambling, a skittering under the car. There was a monster in the back seat. It was pressing its skinny hands against its teeth and rocking from side to side, as if to keep a secret, as if to stop it laughing. It was sometime during the Battle of Britain, when hurricanes and spitfires were up from dawn to dark and The noise of battle was heard all day in the sky, when the English countryside from Thanet to Severn was dotted with the wreckage of planes. It was in the early autumn, when the chestnuts were ripening and the apples were beginning to drop off the trees. It was then that the first gremlins were seen by the Royal Air Force. And so, there on the Dover-London Road, a new word was born. This word was to spread through the RAF like prairie fire. It would travel over the seas to the pilots in Malta, to the desert airdromes of Libya and Egypt, and to remote landing grounds in Palestine and Iraq. Someone mentioned it in India and someone else in Ceylon, and now they all had it. It was a very famous word. The Gremlins, a Royal Air Force story by Flight Lieutenant Rahl Dahl. Well, as always, uh, be careful where you are in that developing uh, situation. Uh, Okay, I have to uh, get back on the road myself here. Where are you headed this time? Uh, I don't know why I said that, actually. Um, it, it just seems like the, the research never ends, you know? Like, there's always a next place to go. It, it, it's strange. I, I, I sometimes have felt like I can't stop moving, learning about all this. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've had these thoughts that there's really nothing else to my life but moving on toward the next story. Like, uh, uh, for example, I know that you must have told me your name, um, but it's just, uh, it's just not in my mind anywhere. Like, there's just, there's just these stories that we keep learning about. Yeah. Yeah, I have the same thoughts uh, about my life. 
and your name. It's unsettling. Yeah. No. Anyway. Yeah, I'll uh, talk to you later. Bye.